Chapter 10 Awakening Expansion Creatures Armored Ogre The Darkspawn scavenged their armor from the Deep Rose. From lost thighs and from battlefields where vast armies once clashed. Typically, only Harlocks, Shrieks, and Genlocks were any such protection, ogres being far too large for conventional armor. But occasionally, the Legion encounters ogres wearing crude patchworks of breastplates and shields, feathered together with rope and wire. While better than nothing, there are many vulnerable gaps in the assemblage. Thank the ancestors that the Darkspawn and their ghouls make such lousy craftsmen. From the Journal of Cordal, Legionnaire of the Dead. Blighted Werewolf When a man in West Hill told me about this encounter with a blighted werewolf, I was inclined to believe him. Although werewolves may be abominations of a sort, wolves possessed by a rage demons, or so the story goes, it is true that their bodies will still live. The blight is known to corrupt bears and wolves in addition to humans, elves and dwarves, so it is conceivable that any living creature, even a werewolf, is at risk. The man saw the beast ambush a bear, springing from the shadows with such speed that it seemed a blur. The bear was dead in seconds. I thank the maker that I have never seen a run-of-the-mill werewolf. I am sure I never want to encounter one that is blighted. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Genetivi. Chart Sylvan Occasionally, demons attempt to escape the fate by possessing something other than mortal flesh. By corrupting a tree, for instance, a demon avoids the madness that results from possessing a sentient creature. Demon possessed trees are known as wild sylvans. On rare occasions, demons possess trees almost completely destroyed by fire, but that still retain a spark of life. This union often rekindles the fire that first damaged the tree, resulting in a sylvan that burns continuously without being destroyed. The Children The children appear to be twisted mutations of Darkspawn. They have set even Harlocks, Genlocks and Ogres to fleeing. The monsters appear first at child grubs, gruesome larval creatures that wriggle on the ground. This is the only vulnerable stage of their development. To squish them is to do the world a favor. When grubs devour the flesh of slain darkspawn, a dramatic change occurs. To a sound of tearing flesh, legs emerge. The child can now run down its prey with startling speed. Upon gorging itself again, the child transforms further developing spindly limbs tipped with spikes that skewer prey. These foul creatures are the progeny of the mother, a mysterious brood mother about whom little is known. The Disciples The Disciples are darkspawn that have become sapient after some sort of processing of awakening, after which they choose their own names. They are cunning, powerful, and hold influence over non-awakened darkspawn. The Disciples are split into two factions. Some serve the Architect, some serve the Mother. The Architect is responsible for awakening the Disciples. Those who now serve the Mother appear to have turned to her, because they resent their newfound freedom. Inferno Golem It's so much better when it's on fire! Centuries ago, during the Dwarven Empire's Golden Age, Dwarves commanded vast armies of golems. Golems guarded the thighs and patrolled every branch of the deep roads. As men of steel and stone, they were eternal, indestructible, and perfectly obedient. But Paragon Herol was not satisfied. He wanted Cal Herol's golems to be greater. In his forge, he gave them hearts like furnaces that would burn ever more. Thus became the Inferno golems with eyes that burned and veins coursing with molten lava. Baroness of the Black Marsh The magic worked! I banished the dragon's essence to the fate, but the enchantment was imperfect and the bond between spirit and physical body remained. The beast lay dormant long enough for me to rip her apart and scatter her about the marsh. That should suffice for now. Had the spell failed, I would have perished 
What was I thinking? Working untried magic on such powerful beast? Ah, he sighed. So I saved the soggy cast bit. I don't know what that proves, but these are my lands now, and Orlay must not see me as failure. From the Journal of the Baroness of the Black Marsh Tears in the Veil vale. Studies of the Veil vale have never been thorough. The Tevinters once theorized that the Veil vale is thin in places that have seen great bloodshed. As the Chantry is so fond of reminding us, the Magisters of the Imperium once crossed physically into the Fade, the catastrophe that blackened the Golden City. As the story goes, the ritual consumed a vast quantity of lyrium and the blood of a hundred slaves. But was it the deaths that bridged other worlds, or simply the blood and lyrium? Or both? Demons seize every opportunity, every terror on the veil, to enter our world. Once the veil is torn, it is extremely difficult to mend. Some say impossible. From the lectures of First Enchanter Wenceslas. Pilgrims and Amaranthi The faithful travel great distances to see the birthplace of Andraste in Denerim, yet many make their pilgrimage longer still by visiting Amaranthi. After all, it was from the city's port that Matharoth and his army departed to invade the Tevinter Imperium, and the Chantry of Our Lady Redeemer now stands on the site where Andraste first revealed the Chant of Light. This is why the road that joins Amaranthine to Denerim is known as the Pilgrim's Path, and why the Chantry of Our Lady Redeemer is the wealthiest chantry in all of Ferelden. From Annals of Northern Ferelden by Brother Bedin, Chantry Scholar The Crown and Lion One Saturnalia alone long ago, a bevy of bards met in Amaranthine to determine whose songs best stirred emotion and whose stomachs best digested foul brew. The first bard fell, mid-ballad, into his barley soup, the second into the lap of a lass most fair. Some say forfeiture was worth the price. The next could not keep his innards inside. One by one they succumbed to fatigue, boredom, or insobriety. At the end no man was left standing. There was only I, the lovely and fair Rosalind, master and mistress of the crown and lion, who proved that no man is mightier than the slightest of lasses. From the War of Lions by the Bard Rosalind The Port City of Amaranthi Outside of Ferelden, the city of Amaranthine is now synonymous with the Arling herself, but before the Orlesian invasion it was only a modest fishing village despite a deep portal well suited to commerce. At that time, few other kingdoms had any need to trade with the Ferelden barbarians. The city changed rapidly with the Orlesians came. They built temporary docks to accommodate ships packed with chevaliers, and for a time Amaranthine was the capital of occupied Ferelden. The ban of Amaranthine became one of the wealthiest nobles in the kingdom, as goods like wool were leached from the city's swollen ports. During their liberation, the fleeing Orlesians looted the city, but left it otherwise unscarred. She recovered quickly. Ironically, Amaranthi's current prosperity is the legacy of Orlesian occupation. Do not share that opinion with the locals, though. From Annals of Northern Ferelden By Brothers Bedin, Chantry Scholar The House of Amaranthine The House of Amaranthine were one of the oldest noble families in Ferelden. Their lineage traces to the time of Kalenhad, when Elias Howe was one of the first freeholders to follow Kalenhad. During the occupation, Earl Tarleton Howe, Randall Howe's father, threw his lot in with the Orlesians. After several bitter battles with rebels, the town of Harper's Ford, an outpost governed by Tarleton Howe, fell to the cowslands of High Ever. Tarleton hanged. Brendan brought the Howe family over to the side of Merrick Theron and Logain MacTier's rebellion. Brendan's bravery at the Battle of White River, fighting alongside Bryce Cowsland, earned back his family's honor. When King Merrick took the throne and free for Aldan, Brendan Howe was decorated for his service. From Annals of Northern Ferelden by Brother Bedin, Chantry Scholar.
The Black Marsh. The Black Marsh is a dreary place. So damp you can feel the chill in your bones. Leave your clothes out to dry for a week, and they'll still be cold and wet when you put them on. I called Martin Daft when he suggested we move there. An awful place, he said, but also a place where one can make a great deal of money collecting peat. By the maker's soggy underclothes, he was right. From the journal of Vera, a seamstress. Drake's Fall Legends speak of a place where dragons go to die. In the far south, in the lands of the barbarian tribes, it is said that a dragon at the end of her days lies down and allows the bitter cold to take her. It is not just a legend. I have seen Drake's fall with my own eyes, the ancient bones of these grand beasts piled atop of one another. I felt the power that suffused this place, and knew the Imperium would claim it. We built a city on the bones. We delved deep into the earth, collecting what remained of the primordial dragons who were so like our owl gods. With these bones we created staffs for our magisters, armor for our warriors, and crowns for our archons. We fashioned phylacteries to hold our blood and sarcophagi to hold our bodies, and prayed that they would make us immortal. From the writings of Archon Melos. The Fortress of Calhirol Herol. The Fortress of Calhirol was established by the Paragon Herol and became known as a center of learning for smiths. Its workshops were Paragon Herol conceived his famous improvements to golem resistance and power, and when Herol's favorite student developed a method for storing refined lyrium that is still used today. These breakthroughs brought Calhirol great prosperity, its passageways glittering with gold and silver. For decades, the Thaig was the favored home of apprentice smiths. Unfortunately, as time wore on, only the richest could afford to train there. When the Darkspawn came, Calhirol was among the first of the great Thaigs to fall. Our people still mourn the loss. From the writings of Shaper Azira The Paragon Herol Paragon Herol was born a warrior. He excelled at arms and strategy, but was not content. Herald believed he was born outside the caste system, able to be anything he chose. A warrior, a smith, even a noble. He would not rest until he'd mastered the art of war, the art of smithing, and the art of rule. He was eccentric, maybe even mad. Some said he'd taken too many blows to the head in the provings. Yet Herald accomplished what he set out to do. He trained under the greatest smiths and the greatest warriors, and his achievements in both fields were so great that the assembly could not help but make him a paragon. Thus, Noble House Herol was born. From the writings of Shaper Aziran. Surfacer Dwarfs Cloudgazer, Stoneblind, Skyer. These are how dwarfs describe their surfacer cousins. It's traditional to snort these words with disdain. A dwarf who goes topside forfeits his caste, his house, and the favor of his ancestors. Once he sets foot on the surface, he is no longer welcome in Orzammar. Still, in recent years, a great many dwarfs have moved to the surface. Some are castless and have nothing to lose. Others believe that they have nothing to gain. Some think it's only a matter of time before Orzammar falls to the Rarkspawn. Then there are the merchant cast dwarfs with their frightful flair for business. I met one who nearly talked me into buying my own hat. I dare say most merchants don't give a nugget about losing their caste or the favor of their ancestors. Not the way they're compensated. From Tales from Beneath the Earth by Brother Genetivi The Great Strife Worn inscriptions deep in the bowels of Vigil's Keep tell of the Avar clan that settled here. With our warriors unmatched in skill and strength, and here we settled, in the caves carved by the hand of Korth the Mountain Father. Ruadan, shaman of the people, turned from the gods who had never sheltered him. In his grief he destroyed the gifts of the Mountain Father and brought us low. And Ruadan pursued her, 
she fled into the earth and prayed to Korf to preserve her. He sent deliverance. They called themselves the dwarves, and they protected Kayla. The darkness drove him to madness, but also gave him power. He turned our warriors against us. Kivil sought out the dwarves, and together they bound Radan in this place. Remember Kivil, may Radan forever be bound here. The First Warden The nominal leader of our order is the First Warden, but you can expect little assistance or guidance so far from the Underfells. Even those close to Weishaupt learn to suffer alone. The murmurs are true. The First Warden is often embroiled in the politics of the Underfells and has little opportunity to consider worldly matters. I would like to believe it is a matter of survival, not of political self-interest. Know that your mission is vital. You carry the hopes of our order. If the highest among us holds no noble titles outside of the Underfells, perhaps we will be better situated when the next plight comes. As we all know, it must. A confidential report for the Warden Commander. Vassals and their leash Some kingdoms rigidly define the rights of vassals and their duty to their liege. In Ferelden, a relatively new kingdom, the Arls and Arlesses theoretically command their Arlings, Bans and Lords. In practice, those lessers often zealously maintain their independence. Some Ferelden vassals might be goaded instead of ordered, swayed, not ruled. Vassals owe military obligations to their liege, yet often deny even sworn oaths and signed contracts. In contrast, the vassals expect their leash's protection despite provocation otherwise. A susceptible Ferelden leash applies force, persuasion, and duplicity in equal measure. From A Guide to Statecraft, published anonymously. The Vigil Vigil's Keep is one of the oldest settlements in Ferelden, older than Denerim and Gwaran. The barbarians who battled the Tevinter Imperium chose this location for a fortress so that their warning fires would be visible at a great distance, when Tevinter ships neared the coast. The Vigil has seen battle in every major invasion of Ferelden. Tevinters, rival barbarian clans and Orlesians have all held her battlements. The Vigil was the first fortress to fall to the Orlesians and the last to be freed. The cellar beneath Vigil's keep retains traces of the Avar barbarians. To the Avars, the Vigil was both a fortress and a holy site. The cellars bear monuments to their gods, heroes and their rare military victories. The Vigil's cellars connect to the deep roads far below. Evidence suggests that the Avars and dwarves traded in secret, a breach of promises made to the Defender Imperium in the days before the Darkspawn. Anders. Most people enjoy being kicked in the head to be woken each morning. Me, I'm just so picky. Anders is an apostate mage. He was arrested by Templars who intended to cart him back to the Circle Tower. Vigil's keep was to have been a short stop on the long journey. Unfortunately, the keep was attacked just after the group arrived, and Anders was found standing over the bodies of his captors. He insists they were killed by Darkspawn. Regardless, Anders joined the Warden to defeat the Darkspawn in Vigil's Keep. If he undergoes the joining. Afterwards, Anders was recruited into the Grey Wardens. He survived the joining. If he is taken by the Templars and given leniency. Although Anders fought alongside the Warden Commander at Vigil's Keep, the Warden Commander returned the mage to the Templars' custody after the battle. With a request that the Templars be lenient, given that what Anders had done to help the Grey Wardens. The Warden Commander gave Anders a kitten as a gift. Anders stole the kitten, Sir Pouncelot, in the folds of his robe. Anders' old friend Namaya revealed that the Templars had moved the phylacteries for most mages in Ferelden, including Anders, to the city of Mar Amaranthine. But the warehouse where the phylacteries were supposedly stored were actually a Templar trap. The warden stood with Anders against the Templars, for which the mage was grateful. 
Anders takes great pride in his appearance and enjoys fine things. The Architect The Architect is a powerful darkspawn possessed of an intelligence seldom seen in his kind, and obsessed with Grey Wardens. He seemed to be conducting strange experiments in the old silverite mines near the Wending Wood, although their purpose was impossible to discern. The architect is often seen with a dwarven woman at his side. He treats her with great respect, even affection. No one knows her name, nor has heard her speak. The architect and the mother seem to be at odds. She is undermining his plan, whatever it is. The architect finally revealed his plan as the world commander was preparing to kill his ma the mother. The architect was born with a mind of his own, able to ignore the call of the old gods. He dreams of freeing all Darkspawn from their urge to seek out the old gods, thereby ending the threat of future blights. To awaken other Darkspawn, however, he employs a modified version of the joining using the blood of a Grey Warden. He sent the disciple known as the Withered to Vigil Skeep to propose an alliance, but the Wardens misunderstood the Withered intention and attack. If the Architect is spared. The Warden Commander and the Architect agreed that preventing future blights is a noble goal. The Warden Commander pledged that the Architect's work could continue after they killed the Mother together. If the Architect is killed. The Architect wished to ally with the Grey Wardens to destroy the Mother, but the Warden Commander refused to deal with Darkspawn and killed the Architect. Justice I have no name, only a virtue to which I aspire. A spirit of justice fought on behalf of the villagers that the Baroness trapped in the Fade. When the Warden Commander escaped through the tear in the Vale, Justice was dragged along and trapped in the body of the Grey Warden Christoph. The Baroness' defeat left Justice trapped in the mortal world. Believing Christoph's mission to be worthy, he agreed to travel with the Warden Commander. Christoph's wife, Aura, arrived at Vigil's Keep. Upon realizing what had become of her husband, she accused Justice of desecrating Christoph's body. The distressed Justice, who insisted on finding a way to ease Aura's pain. Justice visited Aura again later, promising to avenge her husband's death. This pact gave both a measure of peace. Justice likes tokens that remind him of the fate as well as items that provide insight into Christos' life. If the Warden Commander saves the city of Amaranthine and leaves Justice to defend the Vigil's Keep, Justice likely died in the second siege on Vigil's Keep. Mary. Allow me to say, I'm very proud to serve under your command. Mary was a knight in Ferelden's army until agreeing to join the Grey Wardens. She can think of no greater honor, nor better way to serve the nation, and is eager to undertake the joining. Sadly, Mary's enthusiasm did not serve her. She perished in the joining like so many others before her, and was laid to rest as a Grey Warden. Nathaniel. The house are pariahs now, those of us left. Nathaniel Howe is the son of the disgraced Earl Rendon Howe and among the last scions of the once great family. He blames the Grey Wardens for his father's death and had intended to assassinate the Warden Commander. Upon seeing Vigil's keep, however, his childhood home, Nathaniel decided to simply reclaim some of his family's treasures. The Wardens caught Nathaniel breaking in. If conscripted into the Grey Wardens, the Grey Commander, impressed to hear that it took four Wardens to capture Nathaniel, invoked the right of conscription, making the young Howe a Warden recruit. If hanged, the Warden Commander ordered Nathaniel executed. If released, the Warden Commander released Nathaniel. If released, then later conscripted. Such mercy had an odd effect on Nathaniel. He returned, seeking to become a warden himself. Nathaniel undertook the joining and survived. In a chance encounter with the house old groundskeeper, Nathaniel learned that his sister, Delilah, had married a shopkeeper in the city. Nathaniel was eager to find her. 
but Delilah was content with her commoner husband and revealed that their father was exactly the tyrant everyone claimed. In time, Nathaniel came to terms with his sister choices and his family legacy. Nathaniel is a sensible fellow who values practical gifts over useless trinkets. If the Warden Commander saves the city of Amaranthine and leaves Nathaniel to defend Vigil's Keep, Nathaniel died defending Vigil's Keep from the army of Darkspawn. Sigrun, a wise man once told me never to argue with someone better armed than the entire warrior cast on parade. Sigrun is a member of the Legion of the Dead, warriors exiled from Orzammar and sent on suicide missions against the Darkspawn. The Warden Commander found Sigrun fleeing a Darkspawn next and Kal Hural, the last survivor of her group. She has broken the Legion's oath by not fighting to her death. If she is not recruited, Sigrun wished to return to Kal Hirol to finish what the legions began, but the Warden Commander deemed Sigrun's injuries too grave and sent her on her way. If she joins them, Sigrun joined the Warden Commander to destroy the Darkspawn nest. After Kal Hirol was purged of Darkspawn, Sigrun agreed to join the Grey Wardens. She survived the joining. Sigrun is fascinated by the first surface world. She collects little curious from all over Thedais. If the Warden Commander saves Amaranthine and leaves Sigrun to defend Vigil's Keep, Sigrun met her end fighting Darkspawn at Vigil's Keep, fulfilling her promise to the Legion. The Mother The Mother is a powerful, intelligent broodmother who holds a large group of awakened Darkspawn under her spell. She is utterly insane, orchestrating twisted schemes with the Darkspawn she controls. The mother and the architect appear to be in conflict. The mother's darkspawn brood are twisted mutations that prey on all who cross their path, even other darkspawn. The architect confessed that the mother was one of his failed creations. He attempted to free her from the call of the old gods, but her awakening drove her mad. She has plotted against the architect ever since. Ogren now let's go introduce some darkspawn arses to my foot. Only polite thing to do. Ogren was once married to Branka, Orzammar's soul-living paragon, but she left him to search for the anvil of the void. Ogren took to drink, then accidentally killed another warrior in a drunken, proving match. For his mistake, Ogren was stripped of his house and barred from barring weapons, for a warrior worse than exile. When the Grey Warners called for aid from the dwarves, Orzammar's throne was contested, and only a paragon could settle the dispute. Ogren, hoping to find his wife, offered to guide the party through the deep roads. But Branca's obsession with the Anvil of the Void had driven her mad. The Wardens helped choose a new king, and Ogren, having lost everything, left with the Wardens. When the blight was ended, Ogren settled down with his old flame Felsi and had a child, but domestic bliss did not last and so Ogren travelled to Vigil's Keep in the hopes of becoming a warden himself. Ogren's passion for strong drink hasn't waned. Ogren survived the joining. His extensive experience drinking bitter swill likely helped. Felsi arrived at Vigil's Keep demanding to see Ogren. Their conversation ended poorly. He admitted to feeling guilt over abandoning his child and resolved to be a better father. If the Warden Commander saves the city of Amaranthine and leaves Nathaniel to defend the Vigil's Keep, alas, Ogren cannot hold off a hangover, let alone an entire army. He died when the Darkspawn sacked Vigil's Keep again. Seneschal Varel Varel has spent his life defending Amaranthine. When Rendell Howe was Arl, Varel briefly became Seneschal of Vigil's Keep, but he repeatedly objected to Howe's orders and was demoted to lower and lower ranks. Nonetheless, he continued to serve with defiance. When House acts turned more sinister, Varel secretly sheltered those in need and used what little power he had to counteract the Arl's atrocities. Soon, Varel was languishing in the dungeon awaiting the execution, but Howe died first. When the Grey Wardens took over Amaranthine, the Order reappointed Varel as Seneschal. Although Varel is not a warden himself, 
His position as administrator of the Warden's lands makes him privy to many secrets of the Order, including the joining a ritual. This rare honor is a testament to his character. Alas, Seneschal Varel was killed in the second Darkspawn assault on Virgil's Keep. Velana I know a human crime when I see it. I have experienced more than enough of them. Velana wreaked havoc in the Wending Wood, murdering humans who crossed her path to terrorize the nearby villages into releasing her sister. However, the Warden Commander discovered that the Darkspawn were to blame for Velana's sister's disappearance. Hoping to rescue her sister, Velana offered to help the Warden Commander destroy the Darkspawn. If she is refused, the Warden Commander refused an alliance and killed Velana, believing her crimes too great to go unpunished. Velana was upset to discover that the, her sister Serani was working willingly with the architect. She pledged herself to the Grey Wardens and survived the joining. An encounter with Velana's former clanmate Maran revealed that the clan had cast Velana out and denounced her anti-human crusade. If Velana's approval fell too low. But Velana grew impatient with the Warren Commander and left the Grey Wardens. If Velana is brought along to Drake's Paul. Serani reappeared as the Grey Wardens were making their way through the Mother's Lair and explained how the Architect has convinced her of the similarities between the Darkspawn and the Dalish. Serani's passion may have swayed Velana's feelings. Velana is fond of her color green, as well as items that remind her of elven culture and nature. If she is left at Vigil's Keep and the Warden Commander saves Amaranthine. Velana likely perished in the second Darkspawn assault on Vigil's Keep. Dayland's Journal Two Plutonis More southern tags have fallen. Varanthike and Kalbarosh are overrun. 4,000 lives lost. The Darkspawn are almost at the gates of Karkharol. The fortress must be evacuated. 4 Plutanis There will be an exodus to Orzammar. Many nobles are appalled, Orzammar being a trade city so close to the surface. They fear losing their stone sense to the surface vapors, a ridiculous notion. But Orzammar is the easiest to defend. 7. Plutonis Scouts have sighted the Horde. It is vast. To outrun the Darkspawn, the commanders say we must leave now, with nothing beyond the bare essentials. 7. Plutonis Addendum I have volunteered to remain behind, with a contingent of men. We'll hold off the Darkspawn so others can escape. Ancestors have mercy. 9. Plutonis the castles are still here, forgotten in the panic. They are five hundred strong. If even half can be inspired to fight, they'll make an army. There is a chance, a small chance, that this will make the difference. 10. Plutonis Two hundred men and women. Ancestors grant that two hundred are enough. 15. Plutonis The Darkspawn have pushed us back to the inner cape. Only a handful of us survive, but we've held them back five days. We could not have done this without the castles. No, not castles. To call them castles would be a mistake. Their sacrifice must not be forgotten. Records of the Black Marsh Some years ago, a dragon rampaged through the countryside, gorging herself on animals and people. Before long, she nested near the village of Black Marsh. Fearing she would drag off villagers to feed her young, we sent men to drive the beast away. The men were never seen again. The new baroness had till then done little for her people, but she emerged from her manor and told us not to worry. She'd been sent from Orlay not just to rule, but to protect. She promised the dragon would be gone by sundown the next day. She set off in the morning, alone. We were certain she'd gone insane. What chance had one woman against a dragon? At sundown there came a loud clap, like thunder, so great it shook the air. Then, 
our baroness returned to us triumphant. Of the dragon there was no sign. The baroness, no longer aloof, sang and danced with the lowest of us. There were dark whispers that the baroness was a witch, but we did not care. Her magic had saved us, and for that we loved her. From the records of the village of Blackmarsh. Christoph's Journal Few in town have heard anything about Darkspawn stragglers. I doubted reports myself until a man told me he encountered Darkspawn in the Black Marsh. Although locals say the marsh is haunted, brave and desperate souls like this man still risk collecting peat. The man said their leader spoke, but all know Darkspawn cannot talk. More horrifying, he described a monster, a worm with legs. Surely he was mistaken about it following the Darkspawn. I shall leave for the Black Marsh in the morning. From the Journal of Christoph, Grey Warden. The Baroness's Secret The veil is weak near the stone circle. Perhaps it's my rituals, but I suspect it has always been weak here. I feel traces of old, ancient magic. Maybe this is what drew me here. I think the girls feel it too. As we approached the circle, they sensed something was wrong. With me? Did they fear me? Something about this place is changing them, claiming them for its own. It is conceivable that using their blood to reinvigorate me traps their souls in the fate. Perhaps they become the same demons, ghosts, spirits who invade my dreams. I... No, it doesn't matter. They are nothing. Peasants while I am a Baroness of Orlay. From the Journal of the Baroness of Blackmarsh Ancient Vows There is an inscription in the stone. And so you are defeated by Avar and Dwarf, bound by the blood of your people. May the hold you heal forever. Whatever was imprisoned here scratched a message in the stone. Kaivil, nothing will hold me. These walls will rot before I expire. When they do, I shall defame your gods, call your mortal shells to serve me, and hunt down every last one of your kinsmen, Avar and Dwarf. Christoph's Note These darkspawn act like no pack I've seen, employing misdirection to keep their location secret. When an archdemon leads, darkspawn are predictable, straightforward, yet these elude even a grey warden. I've tracked the pack through the colored forest, to the edge of the black marsh. The marsh is dangerous, but soon I'll be home, back with Aura. The wardens can take me from her bed, but never her from my heart. The Canticle of Matheroth these verses were carved into statues in the Wending Wood. They appear to be from the Canticle of Mafiroth, which the Chantry includes among the dissonant verses, and acknowledged in the Chant of Light. Spite away all that was good, kind and loving, till nothing was left by the spite itself, coiled round my heart like a great worm. And in my darkest hour I turned from her, and vowed that I would destroy her. At the moment of her death I knew what I had done, and I wept. I shall bring the lands of my fathers to her ward, therein lies their salvation and mine. And she came to me in a vision, and laid her hand on my heart. Her touch was like fire that did not burn, and by her touch I was made pure again. Despair not, said she, for your betrayals was maker blessed, and returned me to his side. I am forgiven. A letter from the architect. Yufa, I know this has tested your patience. You first gave your blood years ago to further our common dream. I know at times it seems we're going nowhere. Trust me, Yufa, I echo your frustration. Vigil's keep was a setback, yes, but minor. I intend to keep my promise to you. Perhaps you should venture above ground. The greenery and fresh air would do your spirit good. 
The Architect's Journal. The Seeker collected two elves, male and female. The rest died defending their camp. Unfortunate, but a small price to pay. The male has since dashed his head on the wall. Odd. Don't all living beings try for survival? The Seeker convinced that he did more than simply collect the elves. He found the elves and humans at odds, then exacerbated the conflict by making the humans look responsible for the two elves' disappearances. He said he wanted to see how the elf leader would react. Odd again. The female elf has developed a bond of sorts with her guard. Many of the other disciples seem drawn to her as well. The seeker says her name is Sarani. Perhaps I should speak to her. Maybe she will understand. A letter from Aura. Dearest Christoph, my sister and her babe are well. I shall leave Jader as soon as they're settled. Expect me at Vigil's Keep within the month. Ferwalden is cold and wet, so make sure your socks are dry before you put them on. I know how it is with men. You can slay a thousand darkspawn, but when it comes to clean clothes and dry socks, you're hopeless. I can't wait to see you. Love, Aura. A Miner's Letter Thaddeus, it's too dangerous to work here. Sure, the money's good, but there's been nothing but trouble since we broke into the ruin. The foreman down the shaft, the scaffold on poor Horace, he'd heard voices calling his name. Then the incident with the stew. An eyeball! Something's not right, Thaddeus. Oh, and that carbuncle on my neck is back. I swear it's the winter curse. Half the men have left. I'm leaving today with the next lot. We can find work elsewhere. This isn't the only mine in Feralden. Carl. The architect's notes. These are scribbles on loose sheets of paper barely decipherable. What happens if the old gods perish? Does the song die with them? The blood is the key. The blood is always the key. The female elf is accommodating, allowing me to take her blood for my work. Perhaps she thinks I'll release her if she cooperates. My disciples report that another elf is rampaging through the woods, killing humans. Revenge for what we did to her kind, only she hasn't seen through the Seeker's rules. We'll keep this from Sarani. If she is upset, she may stop cooperating. Perhaps I should have killed it while I slept. Orders to the Militia The caravans can't get through the woods and the village is running low on supplies. Is that Dalish clan causing trouble again? I know it. I had my men speak with their keeper several months back, and she... I think it was a she, you can't tell with these elves. Said they leave for a remote parts. It looks as though they're back, like leaders' stupid lunchships blocking the road. They're a stubborn race, and more than a little dense. I must trouble you for a favor. Go to the Wending Wood and order them to leave. Mayor Grisby Letter to Randon Howe My lord Howe, some of the men are not pleased with your plan. They will incite others against you. For the plan to succeed, our forces must be united. If word gets out, if even one of them informs Kausland, it will be your head on a plate. I say this with all due respect, sir. Your captain, Lowen. Response from Randon Howe Loan, we cannot afford an insurrection. Put any troublemakers in chains. Do whatever it takes to weed them out. Whatever it takes, Loan, do not fail me. Arl Randon Howe A scout's report. The defenses have failed and the golems are lost. The way is clear from the pillars of Kadash to Kal Hirol. The Darkspawn are three days away from Kal Hirol, four at most. Prepare the thigh. A list of instructions. Irlana, the warriors say we must leave Kalhirol for Orzammar. Here are my things to pack. 
1. I need my gowns. If the trunks can't hold them all, leave the old rose one with the pearl buttons, and perhaps the midnight blue. 2. All my jewels. I don't know when we're coming back, so I'd like to have them with me. 3. At least a week's worth of food, including 10 bottles of wine, 10 bottles of ale, and 30 bottles of water from the spring. Orzammar is a dirty city teeming with surfaces and castles. I dread to think it's foul water. 4. The children will need all their toys. 5. And their beds. Make sure they bring the beds. 6. On a second thought, it brings ours as well. And at least three changes of bed clothes. I don't know where they'll house us. I hear Orzammar's diamond quarter is smaller than House Herald's dining room. Oh, just thinking about it makes me ill. A letter from Liliana. Dearest, I hope you are well. Alas, I am unable to come to the keep as I promised. I am so sorry, but the Grand Cleric herself wishes to speak with me. I will tell you all about it once I've had my audience. Is it true that the Rauxpon have not retreated? No matter, I am sure you have it under control. Wish I could be there, killing Darkspawn beside you. Perhaps you could save some for me. All right, that was a joke. Do not spare them. That would be silly. You are always in my thoughts. Love, Liana. P.S. Maybe you could consider growing some roses around your keep. That would make it so much prettier, don't you think? A letter from Zevron. Greetings from Antiva. I would prefer to be where you are, my sweet. Antiva is so dull without you to brighten it. Even with the crowds trying to hunt me down, this place lacks the excitement of being at your side. Ah, well, I expect the guild master will agree to meet me soon. Or maybe I should kill him. What do you think? I hear the Darkspawn have still not gone away. They are like house guests who overstay their welcome, no? I am saddened you have to deal with such business without me. I must deal with the crows, but when I return to you, not even sharp razors will be able to separate us. Until then, you remain in my dreams, especially the naughty ones. Yours always, Z. Carton's wild last testament. They came to me for help, these free maidens of the Black Marsh. They were young, beautiful, vital, everything she desires. They gave me gold, Jews, and family heirlooms. I imagined their mothers and fathers, uncles and brothers, pressing those treasures into their hands, enough to ransom a life promised to their baroness. I agreed to spirit them away from Black Marsh. She learned from it. She appeared the night before. Her eyes were like flat, dull stones. Her hair was stringy and streaked with grey, and I saw why she needed the woman. I hid them in my wagon. The youngest embraced me before she crawled be between the bales of hay. She said, Maker, bless and watch over you. I drove them to the crossroads, where the Baroness's man waited. He took the wagon. Their families never knew. The witch, as good as her word, brought me a chest of gold. She twirled like a little girl, eyes now sparkling. You've earned every bit, merchant. The gold was no comfort. I saw their faces on each sovereign, heard their voices in the tingling of the coins. I couldn't bear it. I buried it all in the deepest part of the marsh. Still, I found no peace. There will be no peace for me until I stand before the Maker. Carson Wilde Attached is a map to the cache. Darren Lyle's missive. Elmore, I've found what we've been looking for. Better even, stop digging and pack up your gear. I'm heading to the camp. Meet me there. We'll go to Amaranthine, find a buyer and strike it rich. Darren Lyle. Bonnie's angry letter. Corin, is our relationship a joke? Am I a joke to you? What am I supposed to think? Waking up to this love note. Follow my trail of love, my darling. You are my hen, the mistress of my flock. You nourish my body and tend to my rooster. Really, Corin, I tend to your rooster? 
That's the most disgusting thing I've heard in my entire life. You said there was a surprise waiting for me. I'm supposed to follow your trail? Oh, I despise you. I abhor you, you petty, ill-made wart. You said last week that everything would be different for us. Well, you were right. I'm leaving. With venom and spite. Bonnie. Materials for working with Dragonbone. What a lovely specimen. But Dragonbone is so very hard. I need diamond. Yes, that will do. And a balm of great strength to keep the sword from burning my hands. The liquid from a fresh dragon's egg will also come in handy, I should think. Shouldn't be a problem for you. Oh, and a flame rune. Grandmaster Caliber. Do hurry. Materials for working with golem shells. What a day! First, I'll need some wool padding. Working with golem shells can chafe, don't you know? Second, a lyrium potion, made by a master, to ensure the soul that once inhabited this armor is washed away for good. You wouldn't want the golem coming back, would you? Also some pure iron. Pure, mind you. No imperfections at all. And a packet of ground blood lotus. Maybe some soup? No? No. Materials for working with heartwood. Those blasted elves didn't write anything down, and the Dalish are positively unfriendly. I could use some oil to make the wood more malleable, some catgut to string the bow, or to make a handle for the shield, and a flawless ruby. Always handy and certainly pretty. Oh, and I know, a Grandmaster Lightning Rune. A Scholar's Journal. Seven Cloud Reach. Ordered a roast brawl at the end. Love the stuff. I shared the meal with a weary old traveler newly arrived via the pilgrim's path. Told me that he stumbled upon an old structure of stones in the winding wood. He showed me a souvenir he brought back. One of the smaller stones. It looked familiar somehow. Nine Cloud Reach. I remember where I saw the stone. An old history book in Denerim's Chantry. The Tevinters built structures to harness mystical energies. Most have been destroyed, the stones used to construction, yet the traveler claims this one survives. 10. Cloud Reach He was at the inn again and sold me the stone. I'm heading to the Wending Wood as soon as I find a caravan, although people seem wary of the place. 29. Justinian Finally found the caravan. Nervous lot, though. Barely halted to let me out. Found the structure and spent the day studying it. Burned myself on the magical fire several times, but I think I figured it out. Must make a path of fire that connects all the stones in a single loop. Will attempt, after I drive away whatever's creatures making that rustling noise. 